All right, we're going to wrap this episode up with a couple questions. The first one is our, from our friend Sansu. She asks, what are peptides' effective concentrations in formulas since products often contain so little of them, even though it's not disclosed most of the time with vastly variable peptides on the market? How can we be aware as consumers to find effective ones? Okay. <laughs> um, Sansu, I, uh... Last time, Gloria asked me about copper peptides, and I did not like that question. This time, I'm making Gloria also answer a more very difficult question. But I thought this was really good because it literally captures our feelings. <laughs> so we're going to have to be bad news bears here. There's <clears throat> very little you can yeah. do as a consumer to figure yeah. it out because the reality is um, for us, when we're looking at ingredient lists, and you see tripeptide 28 or whatever, we can go up, we can try to look into it to see if it's a unique ingredient name. Yeah. And some of the more common ones, like, I don't know, I'm making up numbers now. It can be tetra tetrapeptide 4 or something like that. And what that means coming from different suppliers, different sources can vary wildly in between. And the name, the um, ingredient name for peptides doesn't actually tell you the structure of this peptide. Yeah. So there is nothing you can do to really decode. Even for us, we have to rely on data from the producers of these peptides. There's based on ingredient names, can't tell you anything. And sometimes you get lucky. Um, sometimes if you Google the name, it might point you to the peptide that it, that it is and maybe some data around it. But the reality is sometimes there are like conflicting names like or like names that's used for different types of products from different sourcing. So here, for the, um, the best course of action is, number one is the oldies but goodies, like one's trade name that's already well known, like Soderma has, we did a collab with Soderma last year. They created Matrixel, which is very well known, and they have a line of other um, Matrixel S um, peptides. Family members, family. family peptides. Yeah, and and we'll tell you what, they're dupes out there like yes. Matrixel that uses very similar inky names to Matrixel that can make it very confusing. So this is when uh, if a brand is willing to use its trade name and identify the peptide, it probably has decent data backing it or else there's no reason for you to get the trade name. Um, I think the second part is the testing on the actual product itself. We do a lot of decodes this year specifically because we see now that um, brands are doing a lot more consumer perception mm -hmm. and sometimes even clinicals and it can be confusing to navigate but if you know how to read the testing and derive the information you need from it, it's a it's a good way to gauge the actual product. Third, but not least, is just, I don't, yeah, I don't have another takeaway. Well, I was going to say to the second point is that we can also tell you that peptides in formulas can behave very differently. Um, there's basically the way that it's formulated can actually help or hinder its actual efficacy, which is why we in this realm, all we can look towards as consumers is to the testing that the brand does on that specific product. Um, that's your surefire way of, of getting any sense of that benefit. But in terms of what concentration to aim for, what inky to look for, there's probably Nothing no way do, of finding yeah. that out because a lot of times these peptides are coming in blends as well. So, yeah. Yeah, I actually didn't even address the point you made about how um, peptides are low use products. You, um, Peptides are sometimes supplied in a blend, right? Yeah. In a stabilized blend or it's in a base of some sort. Mm -hmm. And you might need, um, when you're formulating, you might need one to three percent of the blend. This is where the training part can be helpful. Um, so, for example, in our double play, we use two percent haloxyl. And that doesn't mean we have two percent peptides, but this is a supplied and this is a proven concentration of haloxyl that's going to help. So that's what we use. But a lot of peptides, some peptides on the market are supplied as very concentrated formulas and you might only need. 0.005% to see a fact. It just varies too widely. Yeah. And what's also not helpful is not every peptide is, j just keep in mind that sometimes people think that peptides are only for like anti-aging, mm -hmm. but they also target other benefits as well, like we mentioned with soothing. So there's also that component as well. So yeah. we give you a very long rant to bring you some bad <laughs> news to say that it's not very helpful to decode. Mm -hmm. so, sorry. Oh, sorry about that. Um, but look for any sort of testing here. All right. Second question. This person asks, are derivatives really more stable over time? I tried a THD ascorbate, uh, THD ascorbate serum over time and it turned darker and got lumpy over time. So oh. I did want to say most derivatives are created to overcome stability. Mm -hmm. um, so... The fact that she's seeing this sort of instability happen, we would want to know what else is in the product because where, like how you formulate these, that doesn't mean that it's going to be 100% 
stable. It's going to be marginally better than the original. So we would ask like, oh, it sounds like, is it truly this um, active or is there other actives? A lot of times these are blended with other things that also aren't stable and that they can collectively hate each other. Mm -hmm. So it really just depends. But we would say that if you are noticing something like that, where it gets darker, the formula is starting to change. Yeah, that's a pretty bad sign. We yeah. would also say it's probably time to let that go. Yeah, for sure. And um, that's such a good point. In the specific case of THD ascorbate, I, I do think there's a class of people that's like, oh, it's a derivative. And, and it is touted as the more stable vitamin yes. C. Yeah. And people think it's it's stable, period. It's two different concepts. Most derivatives, like Victoria mentioned, is more stable, <laughs> but not completely stable. So definitely still store it at a cool temperature. And I do want to mention that THD ascorb uh, ascorbate is oil soluble so you will get these serums usually in um in light emulsions and i have seen some separations happen too it doesn't mean necessarily mean the thc score has gone bad it just means it wasn't very thoughtfully formulated <laughs> <laughs> so the product itself is uh and less trustworthy <laughs> But there probably could be other better formulated THD ascorbate products. So yes, exactly. If you need help, let us know. 